Good evening. Welcome to the Township Board of Trustees Committee of the Whole meeting for Tuesday, November 7th. Um, please rise. Mr. Kent, can you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to everyone, and uh, we will start our meeting by asking for an approval of the agenda for this evening's meeting. I so move. Is there support? Just a second. Okay, there's support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? With that, we'll move to public comment, and we'll start on the left side of my room, and then we'll move to the back of the room. Mr. Ert, good evening. Good evening. The screen's off. I see that. <laughs> Edder, 7212 Porter Road. How are we doing this evening? Great. Very Fine, good. Thank you. A couple of little, little comments on your agenda for Thursday uh, night. Item 5B. Yeah, it's fine what you're doing here, but actually there's three motions that are there. There's two, uh, there's one about a, a trustee Manser and Monica in annual, annual dues. What if one of these didn't want to approve one or the other? So. Just a comment on that. You have the same situation down here on uh, item 6B where you're opting out of the state law and it has two zoning changes, but I'm assuming that's two zoning changes to be able to opt out, so it's kind of a package deal. And I do support that, by the way. Very, very much I support that. Support. I also support the one about uh, Sam's Club getting a um, Fuel pump. I like that idea. And then I come to the uh, the budget for the fire department. I hope the city has approved that already. It'd be nice if they do it before us sometime. But anyhow, I'm on one page here. I know there's been a lot of discussion in regards to building maintenance and things that have to do with the building. Who's responsible to do the repairs on what buildings? And I do know what the, the, this board feels should be done. But I notice in here there's an item that says building maintenance, a line item for it. And I'm sure it's for something other than fixing the city's building. But I think the word building, after all we've been through, should be stricken from any fire department budget. <laughs> That's my opinion. It also is here building ins insurance and liabilities. If there's insurance and liabilities to pay, uh, Let's, uh, that word building. Maybe this is for something else than a building. Uh, I hope you know where I'm coming from. And I love the idea there's no capital improvements here. No money for that because there's a big issue with capital improvements. That's enough on the fire department. Let's uh, move to parks and recs. I know we have an employee, a full-time assistant director from parks and recs. Yeah, this is just for food for thought, I guess. That employee is um, also was appointed in 2016 to city council, by city council. That person employee is also on the fire commission. Seems he's everywhere I turn. This just doesn't seem right to me. Uh, maybe you can get away with it, but it doesn't seem right. All of these locations that he uh, functions in are within a block or two of each other. I, I wonder where he spends most of his time. Uh, you know, it just doesn't seem right to me. So um, it's awful convenient for the city. Or is it a conflict? Is it a conflict of interest? I'll just leave you with those thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anybody else that wishes to comment? Any other public comment? Okay, seeing that we have none, we'll move on and close public comment. And we'll move on to our review of our Township Board agenda for November 9th. 
we will have the approval of our minutes, and hopefully everybody will have had, had a chance to review the minutes. We have our consent agenda, items with our treasurer's report, and then also our approval or our reapproval of the reappointment of uh, Trustee Mansour and Ms. Shapiro to a one-year term for the Genesee County Metropolitan Alliance. Mr. Mansour. Chairman Bennett, I just wanted to make a point here uh, that the $150 a year dues for this, uh, for our municipality, is the same as it's been for, I believe they said, the last four years. So it's uh, just to carry over from that uh, respect. Okay. Thank you. So then moving on to the zoning issues, uh, we have the consideration of the application from Sam's Club. Mr. Limita, would you like to comment? Absolutely. Um, thank you, Supervisor Bennett. Uh, on Thursday, you guys will be asked to uh, consider the application. This evening for the Committee of the Whole, we do have representatives from, from uh, the applicant uh, who would like to uh, provide some information, answer any questions that you guys may have. You did see the packet that I sent out, including their application, the letter of, of uh, why maybe it should be a good idea to amend the uh, PUD to allow this fueling facility. And I rather let them speak for themselves or here and and uh, I would just think that you you know might want to invite them up to the podium allow them to introduce themselves sure. and then we go from there mr. Massey oh that was my that was my, my question he, he uh, expressed it okay all right yeah. so welcome and uh, please introduce yourself and good evening members of the board my name is Tyler Tennant and I'm outside land use council for Sam's Club here in Michigan based in, I'm in Bloomfield Hills uh, this evening uh, with me is uh, Steve Pavlachik of CEI in Bentonville Arkansas and then Juanita Payne who's the store manager at Sam's Club here locally um, the reason why we're here is we'd like to have the board consider um, an amendment to the PUD agreement that was entered into in 2004 to allow us to place a fueling facility at the um, at the Sam's Club, and it's on the triangular piece. That's your materials may reflect that it's in back. It's actually across the parking lot from the Walmart. And the fueling faci facility that we propose is going to be six gasoline dispensers with no convenience store, just a kiosk. Um, and um, we have supplied to you a supplement to the application. Uh, that we talk about the history of the plan unit development agreement, um, the consent of the landlord, Grand Sacqua, who's provided us with a written consent for this, and then an explanation, and I won't detail that, but there's an explanation in here about how the retail environment since 2004 has changed for big box retailers like Sam's, um, and in particular, the fueling facility is now a part of all um, new SAM stores and has been for, for quite some time. Uh, we've also detailed in the supplement um, the criteria that we, uh, that the township reviews when it initially reviews PUD agreements or PUD districts, and we've outlined the um, responses to that criteria so that hopefully your packet will be complete when it comes to the criteria under the township ordinance. Uh, I'm going to let Steve Pavlachik explain uh, about the actual design, um, and I think that you may have some elevations or renderings to look at. Um, I know we dropped those off, but maybe Dennis, you have those. And they all received them electronically, so if the board, I do have um, copies of the plans, although they might be a bit cumbersome for the dias, but if anybody wants them, we can certainly send those down your way. But they're the same ones that you received electronically. Good evening, as uh, Tyler said, my name is Steve Pavlachik. I'm with CEI Engineering Associates in Bentonville, Arkansas. I'm a little unique in that I am from Michigan. I'm just down the road in Oxford. And uh, I, I was the original project manager for Grand Sacqua when they, when they did this PUD. On the uh, Grand Sacqua side, we had a different PM for the Walmart side. <laughs> uh, what uh, Tyler was talking about, the fuel station here, this isn't your typical fuel station with a uh, convenience store, customer interaction, that kind of thing. It's, it's strictly, there is a kiosk, it's just to house an attendant. They do have to have an attendant by law. I believe it is to uh, you know, monitor, make sure you know, if there's a problem, they have a shut off, they can hit, that kind of thing. There is a small kiosk, about 200 square feet, uh, six pump dispenser, and uh, it's, it's just gonna be an accessory use for Sam's Club. It will be outside of the, the Walmart pro or parking lot, 
southwest corner of the Walmart parking lot. That's the, uh, the really the only available spot for it. So happy to an answer any questions and here to. Miss Lane. I shop at uh, Sam's Club and my question is, what are the hours of operation that you're proposing for this facility? That's a good question. I do have that answer. Sam Clubs typically, and in Michigan, they are open one hour before the club opens for business and closes 30 minutes to one hour after the club closes. So the typical hours are 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, Monday through Saturday and 9 to 7 p.m. 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Sunday. Miss Lane, are you going to have a truck stop fueling location at that site? Truck stop. I mean, or trucks will. Will they be able? Will they be able to fill up there? No, no. This is just basically passenger vehicles. Right. There'll be a truck that'll drop fuel. Right, there, I understand. But that. it won't be for semis and that sort of. Mr. Guzak. Yeah, I noticed it's just strictly gas. There's no diesel whatsoever, right? I don't believe we're planning to have diesel. Well, yeah, because I didn't see any in there, right. but I thought there are some diesel cars out there, so I didn't know. If but the plan was just to be gas only. Correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, Mr. Massey. A question, uh, what kind of protection and environmental protection that you have to follow when you install a, a fuel? The tanks are so sophisticated now. I don't know, Tyler, you may have had a little bit more on this, but they're, they're double walled. There's alarm systems that if there is a leak or a break in, in that, um, there's alarm systems that go off and it's, it's, far advanced from the old days when you oh. had rusted out tanks and right. lots of spills in that. So no, you don't expect any contamination from the, the tanks? That is correct. <clears throat> okay. Absolutely. And that's something if we need, we can have someone from Sam's Club who certainly much uh, more expert on that than I am. I'm a civil engineer. Oh, right. so what is the depth of the tanks? They're typically, I think they go down about 15 feet. To the bottom. I mean, there is some some pea stone and gravel and stuff that they use to to um, to support them. Okay. How large are the tanks? I believe they are about um, 10,000 gallon each. They do have. There are three tanks, and some of them are kind of a mix between the premium and the mid grade okay. and and that sort of thing. Okay. But I believe um, they're about 10,000 gallons each. Mr. Guzak. Right, and of course that meets all the state guidelines as far as, you know, on a, yes. on a new gas station, you have to meet certain guidelines as far as security, size of tanks and all that's all restricted, right? Correct. And you've met all those requirements, right? Well, right now we're just at the con con concept plan stage. I know, we're but in your plans, you're meeting will. all the requirements, Absolutely. obviously, and getting their approval, right? Absolutely. Yep. Mr. Uh, Mr. Massey. So it will be, I assume the error would be protected from any kind of arson type. Uh, fire prevention. Mm -hmm. and there's there's a shut off and there's I mean okay. they have all kinds of security things. Is, is it done by uh, uh, cell phones, uh, <laughs> computerized? I, I should probably should say uh, that I'm not aware of. Okay. I mean there there is there will be an attendant there and that's their job is to keep an eye on making things run smoothly. And there's if there's a an issue they they have a shut off there. Okay. Miss Lane. I was going to ask to make sure because the people to your west are on wells, as are many of the people to the north, that they may not require, but I would like to see something that ensures uh, a test well to make sure of any contamination aside from things protecting the tanks. Okay. Mr. Lehman, uh, what would your suggestion be at this point? To or Mr. Laddie, what, what's our next step or what are our options? You guys got the, um, we did ask uh, Giffels Webster as our planning consultants to review uh, the request for the amendment to the original PUD to uh, construct the gas station. Um, you, and you did see that in your packet as well. If you walk through their findings, uh, although the first step in the amendment to the PUD and David could come on this as well, um, is to come to the township board for either approval or denial. Uh, my recommendation, and as well as our planning consultants, was that uh, we that you guys would uh, consider moving this to the planning commission and allow them to make a decision after further review. They are the ones who uh, 
are more integrally involved in, in looking through these um, type of things are also ones who are going to consider it and then their recommendation would come back before the board so you guys will, have, will actually be making the ultimate decision on whether to amend or move forward but I think you should do so based upon the uh, guidance and advice of your planning commissioners. Yeah. So I, that's a, I was just going to uh, uh, follow on from uh, Mr. Limita, is that yes, the <clears throat> the planning commission wouldn't make a decision; it'd make a recommendation. Uh, in looking at the information, and of course I'm on the commission, so I'll ask the question: When the original uh, PUD for the site was drafted, I think 2002 or something like that, uh, there was a there was a verbiage in there expressly excluding gas stations. So I would. Uh, there are just probably some people who were around at that time that would understand why that would be. So that would be an area that I would want to uh, look at. And uh, in addition to that, the uh, traffic flow in that little kind of area there seems a little, I mean, there, there's probably three SAMS gas stations in the state I haven't been to. And so it, of all of them, that seems to be kind of a strange setup. So I was just uh, would want to take a look at the traffic flow of that. Yeah, I would concur to send it to the Planning Commission. The, um, I would concur with you, Mr. Mance, who are on the traffic. Um, I think we need to look at the lighting as a township on Dort Highway at the entrance to, uh, to Heritage Park, as well as uh, that intersection where uh, the gas station would be located, just because uh, there are no street lights along the area, and it's very Point. difficult to see. So I think um, if you could take that back to the Planning Commission if we send it back. Because okay. I think the lighting, and there's also a island that, uh, it, when it snows, is hidden in the snow right there at that intersection. But I, it appears that many vehicles hit that island right there at that entrance to where people will be entering for the gas station. Um, I think we need to address that too when we look at that traffic flow. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I'd like to make just one comment on the Giffels Webster report, and that is that. Um, on, let's see what page they have, uh, page two of the report, right. item number four, they say <laughs> that, that because of the exclusion of uh, gas stations in the original PUD agreement, they're suggesting that you might find that to be a major amendment to the PUD agreement. And they cite uh, <coughs> section 3.1.19 sub J sub four, it says that if the Township Board determines that the proposed modification to the final uh, PUD site plan significantly alters the intent of the conceptual PUD site plan or significantly modifies the on-site or off-site impacts of the plan, a revised conceptual PUD site plan shall be submitted according to the procedures outlined in this section, including a new public hearing and review and recommendation by the Planning Commission prior to Township Board action. And again, Giffels Webster, in addition, in, above that quotation, they say that they feel that because it was specifically excluded, mm -hmm. that it is a major change. And so the conceptual review will need to take place at the Planning Commission level, in addition to the site plan issues that you just discussed. And then finally, I think you may get some historical insight uh, as to why um, there was an initial exclusion uh, of gas stations at the Planning Commission level. Um, so I think what you what you may want to do on Thursday is you might want to consider whether or not you agree with the recommendation of Giffels Webster that that it is potentially a a major change because it's specifically excluded and if it is then it'll follow the process that Mr. Limita just described and Mr. Vance were described so you'll be referring it back to the Planning Commission for a really pretty thorough review on the impacts inside and outside of the of the site. We, we did make a change, I believe, with the drive-through for uh, Panera. I don't know if that would be considered substantial, but I think uh, we had said there wouldn't be any drive-through Well, there. And, th and that language, the drive-throughs were excluded as well, so it would follow a very similar process to what we did right. at Panera. Right. But on that one, we didn't have a public hearing, though, so it might not have been as major. I guess the Planning Commission will advise us right. on that, right? I think the Planning Commission should hold a public hearing. I'm trying to remember if we did or not. I, can't, I don't think I we can't did. Remember that might have been before Mr. Manning's <coughs> time, or, or Mr. Bennett. You might have been there, but I know I we had. Yeah, it was recall. a subject of a, a fairly in-depth, uh, certainly site plan review meeting at the planning commission level, and maybe it was a public hearing. I can't remember, but 
Chairman Bennett. Yes. So uh, maybe as recommended, the action of this board is to refer it to the Planning Commission, and then uh, they'll take it up and you know whatever the decision there in terms of the the rigorousness of the reviews or whatever they can recommend. I'll well, send it to them with with the acknowledgement that you feel it's a major right. it's a major right. amendment. If you if you accept the officers. Bless you. Interpretation. Miss Lane. Since I was there for that PUD, I would consider this major. And I think the board, if when we send it back, should indicate to them that we consider it a major. I mean, I'm only one vote now, but it was a major concern when we adopted the PUD. Okay. Well, yeah, our planner has noted that, so mm -hmm. we're just. Well, I'll entertain a motion then. If Oh, no. At well, this is on Thursday, Thursday night. Oh, okay. Thursday. Yeah. True. I mean, I would like to accommodate matter. people from okay. out of town, but we should have maybe put the agenda that way rather than. Well, I think uh, propose. we have a consensus that we're going. I believe, anyways. I, does anybody disagree that we want to send it to the planning commission? I don't. Okay. Well, and we pretty much have a consensus that I believe on Thursday. That's mm -hmm. probably the action we'll be taking then. So right. do you, does the board feel at all that any of the representatives um, from the applicant need to be in attendance on Thursday, or do you feel fairly confident that you have the, your questions answered now? Um, I've got an additional question related to the concern just now brought up, but what has changed? I don't know how long has Heritage Park been there now? Is that going on 13, 10 years, 13 years? Four is 13. Yeah. Have, have things changed over the past 13 years that... Uh, I mean, I, I realize the gas station part of it probably is something that's evolved at, at most of the Sam's clubs. Right. Tyler Tennant again. Um, in your supplement, we provided sort of a history uh, and a status of all of the fueling facilities in the area and also across the country with respect to big box retailers and supplied you with a, an <coughs> article from a trade publication to sort of highlight the idea that what's changed since 2004 is that the retail environment, even in the last couple of years, has changed dramatically, uh, but it continues to evolve. And so a fueling station now is a primary component of all big box retailers like Kroger, Walmart, Meyer, Costco, and what they are is they're membership drivers. Um, although this particular fueling station will be open to both the public and the members, it, it is a, a driver for membership, uh, and to keep us competitive, that's that's what Sam's is doing across the country. Is it's refitting all of their old station, old old stores, with fueling facilities, and um, I can supply you with additional information about the history. But we sort of right. give you a broad overview in the supplement okay. for that. All right. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Massey. I have one question. Sure. My question to you. The other facilities that you're most familiar with, how many acres are there? At the other, I mean where the fueling facilities go? Yes. The locations? Um, this one is 0.67 acres, and I yes. think they're all about, they're all less than an acre. Oh, they are. Uh, from my, my recollection. Uh, Juanita, you used to be a store manager at another Sam's club. Do you know what the size of that one was? I'm not sure what the acres are. Okay. I can certainly get you that information. I would like right. to. Okay, that I'll do that. I'll submit that. Yeah. Mr. Guzak. Or the other ones with the kiosks the same way? Yes, I think so. It's all... basically the same pattern you've been using. You know, yep. you don't want them to shop there. You just want to use the convenience of the gas and that's correct. And to uh, expand your your base, right? That's correct. Yep. Any other questions or concerns? Mm -hmm. And by the way, we do agree this is a major amendment. And I think, uh, based on my review of Panera, the Panera matter, I think you did have a public hearing on that, from my recollection. All right. Mr. Ken, did you have a comment? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Should we uh, be back Thursday night? Or? No. What's the board's wishes? Does anybody think we'll have further questions on Thursday? No, I don't think so. I personally don't feel it's necessary. No, I think uh, Planning Commission will probably. And you'll see this again. Uh, right. right. It works right. its way through the process. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Next item on the agenda is the board will consider 
a motion to approve the Planning Commission recommendation to amend the zoning ordinance on medical marijuana dispensaries in the health care district, section 3.1.12, as well as remove related standards in section 4.77 consistent with the board action to opt out of the new state law re regarding such uses. Mr. Laddie? Um, well, this is, uh, this is interesting. This is sort of a, a follow-through um, to our decision uh, last spring to decide to not pursue regulating mar medical marijuana facilities as defined by the state. Um, what we had done many, many, many years ago is, is we, it, when they first, when state first created this medical marijuana option for uh, providers and caregivers, is the township had adopted um, the definition of a medical marijuana dispensary and had had decided that if one were to come to Grand Lake Township, it should be located in the healthcare district. And however, very shortly after we uh, incorporated that into our zoning ordinance, uh, the, the township board, it, right off the bat, there was confusion about the medical marijuana uh, statute, how it was to function, how it was to be regulated. The township board, like many other communities, placed a moratorium on, on the establishment of any dispensaries in the township. That included this language. And so um, when we reiterated our decision um, last spring and summer to not participate in the, in the new regulation scheme, uh, we thought it was a good idea to go remove that language out of the uh, planning commission, and so, or out of the uh, zoning ordinance. And so your planning commission responded very quickly. And um, <coughs> this is in front of you to kind of just be consistent um, with your current thoughts on medical marijuana. Okay, any thoughts or questions, Mr. Laddie? Well, Mr. Massey, comment, uh, sure. Mr. Chair. Yes. At this point, based on what I've been reading in the newspaper and uh, looking at some of the legislation that's uh, been uh, on the agenda at the Capitol, that's not, that's not enough information to move forward with anything, is it? Well, and we talked about this when we considered whether or not to, to begin to regulate with the new state regulations. And, and that was one of the discussions we had was they're talking about the, the creation of a permitting process. They're talking about the four different kinds of facilities that include dispensaries and grow operations and packaging operations and, and, and the like. And, and then we talked about the 3% of the gross revenues and then the 25% of the 3% reserved for municipalities, and we decided that it was all pretty speculative at this point. And, um, and um, to go along with the, with the general prevailing thought that we didn't want to have the establishment of dispensaries in the township, I think the uncertainty combined with that general prevailing idea um, is what one of the things that, that caused you to opt out. And frankly, I've seen a lot of development in the paper as well. I've seen a lot of lobbying, I think, is probably the best term for it. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but uh, I guess we'll let, we'll let everybody else kind of wade through the, the uh, process and, and see how it comes out. Mr. Okay. Chair? Yes, Mr. Chair. Just so the Township Board understands, I do get a couple of phone calls a week from different agencies that say, what is your position? And I have simply responded, we've opted out. And this week I've been saying it's on the Thursday agenda to remove it from our zoning ordinance. So it's not a quiet issue, but it's, it's at least out there and people are doing things. I received a few phone calls and I think uh, Mr. Laddie has our previous board had a uh, number of calls, but uh, I think those have settled down since uh, our last action that we took. Okay, we'll move on unless there's any other questions. Under operational issues, um, the board will consider a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation of entering into an agreement with Bodman Law to represent the township in workplace employment law matters. Mr. Limita. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you guys do have a, a, a transmittal from me uh, in regards to this matter that you'll consider on Thursday. Uh, we also have this evening uh, two of the attorneys from Bodman in uh, Aaron Graves and Maureen Rouse Ayub. 
uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions. I did previously hand out before the meeting started uh, some copies from them of a, a uh, there's some additional information here regarding some bios of the attorneys involved um, as well as their law firm. Similar to what I sent forward to you in the packet that uh, kind of gives you a description. Uh, as you guys know, we have been with Keller Toma as our workplace employment law counsel. Uh, up until uh, we had uh, attorney Rick Fanning as our representative up until September he left to go to work for Michigan State University and that left us without representation uh, there was a little bit of confusion at the firm we weren't sure where that counsel was going to come from we did it, it ultimately identify and he came in uh, it this consisted of the human resource person in Colleen Nedzwicki uh, supervisor uh, Bennett myself and uh, Chief Wiles had the opportunity to work with Mr. Graves. Uh, and we also sat down and did a face-to-face -face interview with a representative from Keller Toma who would be available to take uh, over us as clients. Um, based upon our, our meetings and our research, uh, as well as um, just so you guys know, I do I have a relationship with uh, Bodman as representing Marquette Township, my prior municipality before coming here. And uh, so I did know uh, somewhat of, of how they work. I'd rather have Aaron and Maureen explain to you the, the philosophy that they bring to the table when it regards employment law, uh, rather than hear it from me, and, and uh, hopefully that you would support my recommendation. And certainly, um, Mr. Bennett can answer any questions uh, as far as the interview went, and I'm sure Chief Wiles would be happy to weigh in <coughs> on his experience uh, to date. With that, um, Aaron or Maureen. Good evening. Good evening, Board. Uh, I'm Aaron Graves. This is my partner and co-chair of the Workplace Law Group, uh, Maureen Rouse AU. Um, basically, we, I think we have a little bit of a different philosophy than many law firms. Uh, we like to be very proactive and responsive um, because we know that when you have employment issues that they can quickly become much bigger issues. So we like to work with your supervisors, your managers to help prevent those issues from growing, stop them, before they become a distraction for the, for the uh, township, before they get <coughs> in the newspapers. We want to make sure that you're you know, running business as usual and we're, we're kind of nipping those in the bud as soon as we can. So we're more than happy to answer uh, any questions you have. Mr. Mr. Massick. Chair, I have a question for clarification. I'm not familiar with all these law terms, but help me out here. Workplace law and employment law is the same thing as labor law? Yes, sir. Okay. It covers the whole gamut, though. So we make the distinction. So labor law is your traditional. Yes. When you're, you know, dealing with your contracts and issues like that, then you have employment law that's, you know, your day-to-day -day advice, your counsel to prevent those troublesome lawsuits from arising. So it covers the whole gamut. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, sir. Uh, Chairman Bennett, thank you. A <clears throat> uh, question I have, I mean, that you're new to uh, the township here, and I think our previous... Uh, attorney had been here for, geez, I don't know, a number of a number of years. So I guess uh, as uh, as you would look at uh, accepting this um, um, account, I guess, uh, would that involve a review of our <clears throat> existing um, workplace or our practices uh, assessment by you to you know kind of both familiarize yourself with them and maybe make uh, recommendations to us on uh, what, if any, um, issues you find. Absolutely. Um, that'd be something that we would be happy to do. We would recommend that just so that, we, number one, we have a background. Uh, number two, that we can, just like you said, catch any issues that you have. We routinely do that with our clients, you know, that they have handbooks, policy manuals to make sure that they're up to date. Um, on the other hand, if you tell us, no, nope, we don't want to have that expense out there. We just want to, you know, when the issue comes up, we'll give you a call. Then we'll look at it as it comes. We can do that, too. But... Um, generally, the best practice is to make sure that you're compliant. And an excellent point, because what a great way to build a relationship, right? That we all start right. on the same page and we know that our, our executive committee mm -hmm. meeting this morning, our executive uh, staff, uh, executive board, did discuss uh, that this morning, um, the, going down that route. So, yes, Mr. Mansour, very good point. And I think if we're going to act proactively, um, we certainly want to 
to look at it, that option. It does seem that if a lawyer is going to be proactive about something, that they would have to have some familiarity. And, right. and if you assume that we're going to keep this uh, mm -hmm. company for a number of years, then it's a good investment early on. Correct. We have seven different collective bargaining agreements between us and various employee groups. So that's where the expertise comes in. We'll, you know, we don't want to wait and then be the ones who are calling and saying, well, you know, hey, you guys, can you help us out with this situation? In fact, in the interim, since we lost Mr. Fanning, like I said, Chief Wiles uh, has availed himself of uh, Aaron's expertise, Marine's expertise in a couple of instances. And those are the kind of things where we want to send them all seven labor agreements, have them do a review. Um, I mean, anytime an attorney's looking at somebody else's work product, there's going to be, I mean, a lot of the AFSCME groups or a lot of the POAM or whatever are boilerplate. They put specific language in there, but also attorneys write differently. And there's some things that you know, I believe that could have been cleaned up in our prior agreements. Um, and I'd, I'd like to hear, you know, an independent person look at them and provide that as well. We're also in the process of renewing or redoing our uh, employee manual right. so it's really a good time to have that completely reviewed just to make sure that there isn't something that we miss that may be lingering that needed to be addressed um, just to make sure that again being proactive and uh, I've always felt like working with these guys that it was that whole ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure they're great litigators if we had to on the back end but we'd like to avoid that at all costs yes much more economical too Miss Lane we have in some of our contracts the opportunity, if we were going to make changes, to meet with the unions and have those discussions. Uh, in reviewing some of the contracts, <coughs> would you consider doing that sometime before the contracts expire in order to make our day-to-day -day operations smoother, more functional, and things like that, knowing that there is that ability <coughs> in the language of the contracts? If you have a reopener in the contract that allows you to go in and renegotiate or change some of the terms, and it makes good business sense for the township to do that, absolutely. Okay. And it's a distinction, though, as to whether or not it's a reopener right. or a labor management conference, because I don't want to get into the legal, but some topics you can ask the union to come discuss at the table before a contract expiration, and some are off the table <coughs> based upon the governing law. So right. it would depend on the issue. Yeah, we'd have to we'd have to look at the contract, and you, obviously you don't want to go in and start tinkering. Tinkering when when you're not allowed to tinker, and then have an unfair labor practice charge against you, and have picketers. And no, we don't, I un we don't, I understand that, that, but I think there are some places where speaking with the unions would uh, make some day to day operations better. Mr. Yes, Mr. Massey. But. My understanding, if I'm wrong, I hope someone correct me. My understanding what Cliff uh, Lane is raising the issue about, that would be left up to you and the superintendent, right? Mm -hmm. To make sure if that's needed. Right. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But they, if they had advice from counsel, they would probably follow advice from counsel with Mr. Lima to having previous experience with this company. Well, I think. I trust the superintendent on his judgment. I mean, uh, we trust him to do a lot of negotiation for us. So at this point, I'm not backing away from that. I'm not indicating that I do not trust the superintendent or the uh, supervisor. I'm just saying that's their responsibility. That's the way I'm thinking. And they will dig deeper, if take a deep dive if it's necessary, whatever is required. A couple of points that uh, I was looking for in council is you know the proactiveness that uh, that I found with our discussions and from the experience that a couple of our staff people have had, but also uh, somebody that Mr. Limita has worked with I think is an added uh, bonus because Mr. Limita is going to be do, doing the majority of the um, discussing any issues with our legal counsel. Um, it's probably going to be a rare occasion, at least I hope it is, that that our board. Um, has to, you know, have any contact. But I think uh, Mr. Lima, if he's comfortable and has a track record working with with this law firm, uh, and and I have, I'm very comfortable with us going this direction. And so I just want to point out one thing. When you said that, um, Supervisor Bennett, remember that uh, these guys represent uh, Grambling right. Township. 
um, mm -hmm. not me. And, and it's it's important distinction because I want you guys to, to understand and support the fact that you know we are looking at making a change with law firms. I want them to be someone that you're comfortable with uh, based on their reputation and expertise, not just necessarily on my recommendation. Um, we all get along like one big happy family right now, but if there was ever to be a falling out, they'll be representing you, <laughs> and I'll be on the other side of the table for them, which is unfortunate for me because I've seen these people work, um, and I'd rather they were on my court instead of yours, but uh, I don't foresee that happening. Um, I think there's always something that we'd be able to work out, but I, I know what they bring to the table, and I know uh, they've made me better in my position. Uh, by the advice that I've gotten from them for the last, whatever, nine years or however long it's been. Um, I know they've made me better in my position. They've made me much more uh, proactive in my approach to employment law. Well, I'll, I'll add to that, then they have my recommendation besides yours. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. So I just a quick question. Um, so how many municipalities does your uh, firm represent? We represent several um, in different I represent uh, two. Uh, I don't know how many Maureen represents, Your but the other partners at our firm Your do practice. represent others. Yeah. So several, yeah. Okay. Mr. Rosette. Yeah, I just had a question. I just wanted to thank you and thank uh, Mr. Limita for bringing you in because I looked through the information. It's very impressive, and I am here again. I applaud you for being proactive. That's what we're all about here, because um, I've been here a while and I've seen how the other ones worked. Uh, but I didn't, is there any way we can see a fee schedule so that way we know what we were looking at uh, comparison? You know, we can, we have our own fees so we can have your fee comparison. Yeah, we'd be able to, we'd be happy to provide that to you. And, and, and you know, generally we're, we're competitive. Right. Um, and we're also willing to negotiate for, with our clients over, over rates so that we're competitive for you. Yeah, it'd be very nice to see that. And that way, I know you're competitive. I just want to see it. And that way we have something to refer to and. Yep. So we know what's. So as a follow-up, we can provide our fee schedule, and if you like, we can present pre present a list of other townships. That'd be great. Appreciate that. Thank you. If you would like that. Uh, for yourselves, and then maybe the rest of the um, people in the practice. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Smiley. <coughs> I uh, am certainly willing to take Mr. Limita's recommendation on your uh, on selecting your firm but but it's not the right word to use yeah. but um, having been here when Keller Toma came with Dennis Dubé he had a superb recommend reputation uh, and so I simply want this board to know that when when Keller Toma came here many years ago they also were forward thinking and did us in good stead for many, many years. So uh, I am in a way disappointed that we're losing them, but I also understand uh, Mr. Dubé's retirement along with Mr. Fanning's may make a difference, so. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I'll talk as long as I can here. Mr. Laddie, have you had any experience with this firm? I've, I've, their reputation precedes them. It's excellent. Um, they are well qualified represent us that's, that's important to me what, what mr Lai thinks yeah uh, the last thing i guess would uh, can we meet it on sundays with mr graves at one o'clock <laughs> if your office is overlooking i asked that it took me a minute <laughs> Clark, I'll I volunteer to be the board rep on Sunday meetings. <laughs> well, they, they said once you get there, it's great, but it's getting there on Sundays. It's a tough part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, um, okay. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? No. Okay. Thank you. Again, Thank you. Um, Thank you. I will ask the question on behalf of this firm and their representatives. Uh, if they provide us with the municipalities that they serve and the rates that Mr. Guzak has asked for. Uh, consensus of the board, do they need to come back on Thursday as well or can we save them a drive from Detroit? It's I don't think they need to come back. Uh, that's just my thought. I see no need for them to return. Does anybody see a need for them? I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. We're good, Thank I think. You Thank you. Okay. We'll get you the Thanks. information you asked for. Okay. Thank, Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. 
item B, the board will hear a presentation on the fiscal year 2018 fire commission budget requested by the fire commission and presented by fire chief Burdett and treasurer Carl Heiser. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. I uh, want to thank you for the postponing the presentation. My illness preceded me. And hopefully tonight we won't have any fires where Kent will have to leave very quickly for us because he's my backup tonight. So, um, Briefly, our, our, our budget for this year, we've had a $50, $55,000 increase in the uh, general money coming into us from the township and a 2% increase from the city, although we do not have the 2% increase being confirmed by the city as of yet because uh, their budget year is a little different than the township's. Although, uh, with the increases, the fire commission itself accepts it, and we, we understand and we agree with the revenue projections for 2018. Under the expenses for the general fund this next year, uh, not too many changes took place, other than two that I wish to highlight, is that we will have staff, uh, two new positions coming into the staff. One is to filling the vacant full-time firefighters position that we had budgeted for last year. We'll be able to fill that this year. We made that accommodation. Um, by doing so, we're going to be decreasing the part-time staff staffing budget by around $70,000 to accommodate for this, since we won't need the additional part-time person on shift. And the second part to this is that we will be hiring also a part-time clerical person, person working uh, 24 hours a week uh, to fulfill some of the office clerical functions that I'm presently handling at the office. Um, this year was the first budget year that we could uh, actually accommodate or have into the budget for all the um, uh, work agreements for the full and part-time staff. So just a couple of the highlights there. We've had some increases uh, in the budget. One is for the part-time staff in the unions. Uh, their contract uh, calls for a, a stipend to be paid for for additional uniform uh, apparel. Uh, it's an amount set for every other year, and it's an even year, so next year is coming in on it. It'll be an increase in uniforms of about $10,000 to accommodate that. Uh, the other portion is for our full-time staff, and that is the increase in, in the phones uh, for uh, their union agreement and cell phone usage. Also, we will have an increase in our contractual expenses for this next year uh, in talking with Mr. Limita. Um, there will be a change in the township's uh, fees to the fire commission, uh, and that is in doing so we're going to decrease the administrative fees and increase in the contractual to accommodate for labor attorney fees which will be billed directly through to the fire commission this next year rather than previously it was handled by the township board through the administrative fees. On the internal fund, this is the last year that the, or in 2018, the, our budget will show the heading of the internal fund. The new heading will be for capital equipment purchases. So the money that's set aside traditionally into the internal fund for this next year, where it's used for operating the vehicles and so on, will be captured under the general fund. And with the new, uh, new category in 2019 for capital expenditures will be for equipment, turnout gear, um, furniture at the station, small ancillary items that will not accommodate anything in building maintenance at all. Uh, building maintenance is just an aligned item for uh, cleaning supplies and so on like that around our stations, all three stations. So that's what the building... Does. That's what building maintenance is. Right. Okay. Your insurance and liability, uh, we will talk it in, uh, our, taken to advisement at the fire commission meeting about dropping the term building and just putting in liability insurance because that's to cover all the furniture in the stations and when slips and falls. The city has accommodated or taken on the uh, structural insurance themselves now. Um, in the narrative, the last paragraph that is the fire service performance and service risks. The concern that the fire commission has had is that we've unfortunately been underfunded over the last few years. Not in anybody's fault, it was just the way the economy worked out that we have not been able to put enough money aside to purchase new, new equipment. Uh, as we go through this, 
the, you know, the fire commission recognizes that the 1.5 mil that we've been talking about will be able to accommodate the new purchases coming in for the next uh, few years. Now with that, fire commission is just asking for your approval for this next year's budget, and I'm open to any questions. Ms. Lane. Uh, one of the lists you have, you don't have a, an amount extended for it, but I happen to disagree with uh, the payer when this comes about. Vehicle exhaust handling system upgrade. You have it down here for station one in the apparatus. It's proposed for real and personal property. Whether that exhaust system, in my personal opinion, is done in one in station one, two, or three, that is a major part of the building. And I don't see why the fire <coughs> commission would pick that up. I, it doesn't have an amount across the line for it, but I simply disagree with who you expect to pay for it. I think the exhaust system is part of the building and should be the owners of the building that pay for it. I don't know what the rest of the board feels, but when you're putting out lists and you did in the very first paperwork that you mm -hmm. gave us, uh, we had a difference of opinion at times with the city and so I just wanted to make that recommendation right now and the board agreed that if you need an exhaust system it goes with the building it stays with the building and therefore it is the owner of the building that pays right I understand there's, there's no that. figure in there because I know no but I but year, so. I, I understand that I understand it's, just discussion it's to make it a discussion point or my statement is that's part of the building. It belongs to the building, and it shouldn't have the fire commission as the payer. It would be either the city or the township. Whosoever building needs it, that's who pays for it. Does anyone disagree with that on our board? Or? Mr. Mr. Guzik? Right. Um, go ahead, Mr. Well, Guzik. I just had a question because I... With um, regard to that? Yes, to regard to the, uh, the exhaust system. Uh, I know the township paid for the exhaust system in this building, I believe, mm -hmm. as well as the, the one out at Genesee at the uh, hospital, correct? Number three. Station three does not have doesn't have any exhaust system that we have here at two. Okay, so it's just here, right? Yes. And I don't know if the city paid for theirs or not. Uh, I'd, I'd have to do some research on that. We can have it for you on Thursday evening. Right, and then the other caution on that is, I don't know if you have that built into your budget to cover that, because <laughs> we were trying to cover the new trucks and all the other equipment, we weren't necessarily, I don't know if we build in enough to cover if something went wrong with that system, whether, you know, it, I don't think it's in your budget. Um, and I think the board felt that we wanted to pay for that, but technically if you're a tenant of a building and you need something specific for your business, the you know, you have to, you have to negotiate with the building owner whether they're gonna pay for it or you pay for it. Because if you're the only reason you need that, and you obviously need it, mm -hmm. you're like a you know an individual case. So most buildings won't pay for something that most people don't need. Well, that, although you know if you have a commercial garage or any type of business that has a garage, um, but usually they convert it to their that. specs because they want it that way. Okay, right. but anyway, you know I I think we paid for it, and I and I'm okay with that. Because I thought yeah. it's just like the fire, you know, the t the training tower. We paid for that, and when it was bad, we didn't hesitate as a township to say, "Well, we got to take care of that building." Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, I, you know, Mr. Kent, I'll do some more research. I was going to, Earl took my comment. I was going to make about station two in in our exhaust system there. Yeah. All right, and okay. but that's why I want to clarify that it's not supposed to be a fire commission, even though it's doesn't have any money across from it. I don't want a payer listed for something that I think is the Mr. wrong Mansour. payer. I understand. So uh, I guess kind of building off of that a little bit, we have had some discussion here uh, at a previous meeting about being more uh, prescriptive about what would be considered you know, capital uh, and what wouldn't be. And I think if we are gonna go ahead and approve this budget that I'd like to staple that understanding to it uh, as a part of our as a part of our uh, uh, agreement to it. 
Mr. Laddie? Well, we haven't, again, we, uh, Mr. Lehman and I have had discussions with uh, Mr. Griffin and the uh, manager of the city, and we have talked about the, their desire and ours to come up with very specific definitions of what are what are fixtures in, in, in each of the buildings and I'm confident that we're going to be able to to agree on that language and and I think we should certainly add this apparatus to the discussion I don't know if we'll have it ready in time for incorporation into this budget but if you want if we want to make a footnote in this budget that we will attach that language when it's been approved that would be certainly fine. Uh, yeah. Someone's here to vote. Mr. Massey. And <laughs> Mr. Chair. Okay. There is no election in the township today, ma'am. Voting for this. Not. Not in this, not in Grand Blank Township. In, the in Grand Blank City, there is. In Grand Blank City, or City County. Yes. No. I don't know. No, no, that's fine. We're glad you cared enough to come out <laughs> to at least vote if you were going to. <laughs> okay, thank you. Are you going to vote for it? <laughs> Mr. Massey? Uh, Stay if you're voting for it. Mr. Chair. I agree with the attorney. I think that should be further discussion about the fixtures because uh, in the past I, I raised this issue and we, I didn't use the word fixtures, but I used another phrase. Right. So we need to take a deep dive into the fixtures and see mm -hmm. where we're going with this. They're working on it now, but well, probably it sounds like there's consensus that we can attach it once it's uh, yeah, completed absolutely. that definition. So, not like anybody has a problem with the exhaust system making sure that's part of uh, the building as well instead of Mr. Manson. Yep. So um, moving past that, or actually it was right above that, there was a <clears throat> the capital expense um, um, for uh, new equipment. And in just, uh, I mean, it doesn't affect uh, fiscal year 2018. But I see that we've kind of doubled up in terms of uh, big pieces of equipment for 2019, the ladder truck as well as a um, yeah, I, I have, have, heavy rescue. And looking at the amount of uh, life expectancy uh, and the, the years that the equipment was in, the existing equipment was put into service, I guess I would just like to, you know, kind of get some more comment about why the uh, ladder truck would needs to be replaced and and why uh, you know comment about why we wouldn't kind of move it out one year to kind of put us on a one big piece of equipment per year um, well, replacement. Well, we, we started this process we were following the National Fire Protection Association guidelines of a 20 year replacement schedule mm -hmm. that a frontline piece of apparatus should be in service for no more than 10 years and then go into reserve and then backup status after that. And at 20 years, it should come out of service uh, simply because of all the, the changes in the safety equipment that's coming on the equipment uh, in 20 years it needs to be replaced and also with equipment maintenance. What we've done here is we have a truck right now, the heavy rescue that should have had a down payment put on it uh, in 2017 of $400,000 to get it replaced. Unfortunately, we don't have the money in the budget to do that. So that has been pushed back until 2019 and we're anticipating that the, with the approval of the millage that we should be able to do something yep. at that point. Um, so that's the only reason that, why that's, that's Yep, I was really more concerned about the, the ladder truck that was two years newer, seems to have five year longer expected useful life and, and we're kind of <coughs> putting it on top of the other piece of equipment in 19. Yeah, that's the only reason why, because the rescue should have been handled in 17. Okay. So it would have, so basically it would have been ordered this year if you would, would have been ordered fund. this year for delivery. And the ladder truck would have been on its own, right? But yes. And then of course, because I think I brought that up to you also, I said, well, can't you, you push did. it one more year? He said, no, we can't because we're already up against the 20 year deadline, right? Yes. So, so Mr. Guzak yes. and, and, and uh, Chief, so yes. then do we need to change the column heading of the one that says expected useful life in years and maybe turn that to something else? Um, 
well, state. again, when we did this spreadsheet, that was what we went with. I mean, we can look at changing it. I, I really wouldn't recommend that we go anything past 20 years. So if, if we were to change the 25-year expected life on the ladder truck to something other than that, then that might uh, be, a, at least for oh, me, I, a, a better sorry, rationale. I, I apologize. I didn't notice that, what you were talking about there. Yeah, so we could change, yeah, we could change that back to the, to the 20. We could do that. That's fine. Okay. Mr. Ken? Thank well, a couple things, I guess, a clarification on that. I would like to see, <clears throat> we, <clears throat> excuse me, Chief, we don't roll that ladder truck no. for every run, right? Like we would a bumper. No, not so every run. I would like to see just some study. And if the NFPA st uh, standard is 20 year replacement, is that for full time departments or for full or departments the size it, it, of ours, right? Yeah. It doesn't really, it's not determining a factor of yeah. what type of department it is. It's the life expectancy yeah. of the equipment, the new safety equipment that's coming on. It's, it's a major, you know, it's a major a purchase. Five foot aerial is a major purchase. And I'd like to make sure we're not just putting that in a schedule that says here's what we're supposed to do. I really want to make sure there's a need for that because when I look at that truck, it, it doesn't look like there's a lot of wear and tear on it. But Anyway, and, and in fact that it sets a lot when we run runs, and I know we do use it a lot in uh, mutual aid, but uh, what, uh, what I wanted to clarify uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Laddie, uh, as a point of order, the board last year uh, give direction to the fire department as policy. I believe we may have even, I don't know if we did anything in, in as a vote or not, but approval of this schedule be it as it is doesn't give authorization to start ordering vehicles is that correct that's correct in, in fact last year as i recall and mr lehman can correct me if i'm wrong but we we specifically excluded <clears throat> certain capital purchases yes and uh but that theory is absolutely true it's not a, okay. it is not the the beginning process of the ordering phase there you go that's all i wanted to clarify very good point no we understand that so. thanks so, uh, Chief, uh, from the time that you put a down payment or deposit, uh, are most of the trucks like a year or two before? It'll take about a year for these trucks to be constructed. Yeah. You, you have a, uh, approximately about a six to seven month planning phase as far as what you actually want on the truck in case you're going to be changing the vehicle around, which in, in 20 years you're going to be changing the vehicle. You're not going to be buying the same type of truck. So at that 20 year mark, you get about a six months for planning, drawings, uh, blueprints to come back, bid process to go out. Once that's approved, then the down payments made and the order's placed. And after that, it'll take anywhere from six, uh, eight to uh, 12 months to get done. It might be a newer style truck where it could take a lot longer than that. When I say a lot longer, maybe 16 months to get it done. Or it may be a truck that's readily available and we could get it a little bit sooner than that. But about a year is an odd average. Mr. Mansour. Thank you, uh, Chief. So maybe I'm not understanding this correctly. So the uh, line item for the ladder truck replacement, mm -hmm. is that, I see two entries there. Is that like a down payment one year and a final payment in 21? Is that how that's that works? That's correct. Okay. Right. Because the, the truck was originally purchased in 2001. Okay. It was actually purchased a couple days after 9-11 occurred when we took delivery on it. So okay. the first payment of 19 is the down payment in 2011 or 2001. I'm sorry, 2011 is the final payment. Thank you. Okay. There probably isn't a whole lot of competition amongst, I mean, there's probably one manufacturer of these or? There's several manufacturers of trucks, okay. uh, but it all depends on what you want on the truck. Certain manufacturers only have uh, proprietary Equipment. equipment on them or how they're built themselves mm. um, we would be putting these be, these out to bid to numerous companies okay. to see what we would get back uh, it's quite often you may put out something to bid it's proprietary to a certain vendor other vendors that we can't build it or they come in with their idea of what you're what you're looking for so okay is there new technology that these trucks will offer that we currently don't have that you know of, Chief? Uh, well, actually, there's one little bit of technology out there today that I am very interested in purchasing, and this will find benefit the larger homes in the southern end of the community, and that is a 100-foot straight ladder truck with single axle that would allow us to get into driveways a lot easier than we could with <coughs> our present ladder truck. 
Not saying we don't need the present ladder truck. We do for the heavy commercial industries that are coming in, but this would be more where you could have this respond to some residential fires and a little more maneuverability. Hmm. Okay. Mr. Massey. Uh, on that issue. Yes. How is the stability when you expand the ladder? Well, the stability in the trucks, depending upon which manufacturer you have. Uh, one that we're looking at is a manufacturer called E1, where the outriggers, what they call the outriggers to stabilize the truck itself, would fit in the footprint of a standard driveway. Uh, some of the other ones they have are single axles that are out there now, uh, but the outriggers expand farther than a driveway. So they may not be something we really want to look at. But as far as you'd have to set the outriggers out to stabilize the truck in order to put the ladder into the air. The trucks won't let you do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. That's it. Any other questions or concerns? All right. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. Thanks for all the work that uh, you do and Mr. Heiser, our treasurer, volunteers his time to do. Item C, the board will consider a motion to approve an agreement between the Genesee County Road Commission and the Charter Township of Grand Blank for the construction of a roundabout at the intersection of Hill and Belsey Roads. This agreement authorizes the use of a portion of the township allocation of the 50-50 annual allotment from the Road Commission for 2018 to pay for the required 25% local match for the construction project. Uh, Mr. Limita, uh, one of the things that we were talking about is that 25% um, is just of the local portion, right? I mean, the, the overall cost of the roundabout is substantially more than that, what that 50000 or whatever dollars is. That's correct. Um, what you're seeing there, the roundabout construction is about $850,000. The engineering and inspection fees are $212,000 uh, for a grand total, just uh, north of a million dollars. Um, it was, uh, this has been in the design phase for uh, several years now. Uh, the commission, the road commission agrees to fund 75% of the local share of the project and, and what we're uh, accountable for is 25% of the local share. Uh, what we've asked the road commission if they would allow us to write the agreement uh, so that we can use our 50-50 uh, money for uh, doing this because they had moved this project through and had inadvertently, um, it's ready to go and, and ready to bid and build and they're going to build it next year, um, but it hadn't come before us back again to ask for uh, our commitment on, and sign agreement on our 25% share of the local portion of it. So uh, because of that, we hadn't had it built into the budget is why we came back and asked if they would consider allowing us to use the 50-50 money that we have allocated annually. This would give us um, where we were only going to have to come up with the $26,000 um, actually for, out of our 50-50. The road commission will spend the other $26,000. Um, so it, it limits our costs entirely for the entire $1 million project to $26,000 in effect. Mr. Guzak? Um. Yeah, so it's a total of only twenty six thousand, right? Because on the chart it says Grand Blink Township's construction cost is twenty six, and then Genesee County Road Commission says the Grand Blink Township allocation. So that's allocation is the fifty fifty money. So, it, like we've used but in the past, we, but well, don't we still have to match that? We don't match that then. No, we, that is the match. Our twenty six thousand dollars right? is their match, and they're going to put up twenty six thousand. That's the fifty fifty. So they'll allocate so much every year for us to use, right? And. Uh, we'll do a variety of projects. Typically, it's ditching or minor road repairs right. or something. Um, and what we're doing is we're just using a portion of 2018s to cover right. this. We'll still have additional funds left over, additional 50-50, but they will match up to a dollar amount, uh, whatever we use. And right. so we're just we're just selecting to use a portion of that to cover this project. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Mansour. Yeah, you know, I was I was looking at this and. I think to myself, you know, no matter whose money it is, $1.1 million for a roundabout, when we've got, like, roads like Pollock and other ones crumbling, I just, I mean, I wasn't here when this decision was made, and I mean, it's kind of like the tail end, and I mean, I don't know what kind of, but, but there's, I mean, really? $1.1 million for a roundabout? That's the best use of that money? I mean, it's just, 
it's kind of we don't make the decision on that right? I, so it isn't this board that decided to spend that money we have, we have no but say what if we didn't agree to give them any money for it no, I mean, okay, I, I get the point. $26,000 is our contribution. It's not much. But just thinking about so solving that issue with $1.1 million is right. just unbelievable. Actually, we're losing 52. You know, the other 26 we could use for something else. Yeah. So it's 52 that we're losing. But I agree with you. Yeah. I'd rather see the million bucks go down that other road that needs it. I agree with you too, Mr. Mansour. Right. I think one of the, the toughest parts is explaining to the community. I mean, we uh, we have another project too that uh, there's a public hearing coming up um, in another week on uh, the widening of Fenton Road. Uh, they're going to make it three lanes between yeah. Grand Blank Road and uh, Cook, Cook Road. Road. Cook. And uh, yeah. you know, on social media, you'll see people commenting, "Hey, why are they doing that? I wish they would pave my road." Well, part of the problem, and, and Mr. Mansur, you know from going to the Metropolitan Alliance meetings that uh, they have different pots of money that the federal government gives them <coughs> for safety projects. They have another pot of money for certain types of roads. Um, and so they, they have funding for a variety of projects that, and I don't know if, if the funding was specifically for safety projects that have to be like roundabouts, what have you, but some of that the money is dictated by the federal government, other state, but uh, I would venture to say that that money was dictated that it had to be spent on something like that or else I believe Genesee County probably would have found some other place for that. But I do have to say that uh, one of the, I, I would guess that's probably one of three <coughs> intersections in our township that probably get the most uh, complaints from residents, that Belsey and Hill, um, Embury and Grand Blank Road and Reed and Porter are probably the three intersections. I don't know if Chief probably can confirm that or maybe they're, I'm missing one, but those are probably the four that I hear from people the most on. Uh, yes, Mr. Massey. Just to comment on what, expound on what you're saying. I didn't think the congestion at uh, Hill Road in Belsay is as bad as, as it is at Emory Road. Yeah, I'd have to consult with the road commission, but it, it's pretty bad coming from a couple <coughs> of different directions. From I've been out there and I, I've witnessed it, and uh, I, I I see it on social media and my emails uh, that I get from people. Go there. At, so go there at six o'clock. Yeah, go at six yeah. o'clock. You'll avoid it, it at all costs. You. Yeah. This intersection has been identified for many years as one of the highest traffic spots and most congested areas. It also results in in uh, quite a bit of accidents because of the impatience of people trying to get through a four-way stop. Their initial reaction was that they were going to put a traffic light there and was supposed to be up there this year and then they <coughs> pulled back that decision uh, and decided not to put a temporary traffic light up, which we also would have had to pay 25% of the cost to install the traffic light and then we pay the electrical um, for, for it to run. Uh, they changed their minds after they'd already agreed to it. We'd agreed to it and signed it and then they pulled it back and went with this. One of the biggest, you know, when you look at a million dollar cost, $642,000 is coming from the Michigan Department of Transportation. Uh, the rest of it is local from the Road Commission. So a, a big portion of it, or, or more than 60%, is coming from the MDOT. Um, we know we had to do something there. Maybe a traffic light would have solved it, but uh, there's a lot of times you go through there, you don't see it, but in the morning on the way to school and then at 6 o'clock. So the two biggest high traffic times were in the morning and evening, and they could be backed up for quite some time. Uh, as well as so there was a safety factor. I think that's where the MDOT um, grant came in for it because of the safety factor. And I think uh, a stoplight there would run between two and three hundred thousand dollars. Those aren't cheap as well. Mr. Massey? They added a lot of new homes north of the intersection. I mean east of the intersection on Hill Road. Right. But There's quite a few new homes were added there. Yeah, well we yeah. that that area has uh, grown over the years and Obviously, the traffic count justifies to the road commission making the, the change. Ms. Lane? I made the comment today because I have been in Rochester with their roundabouts. So I want this board to know that down there, they use perennial grasses and decorative kind of things that don't take a lot of maintenance. And I hope that we get something like that, that we don't go to the straight asphalt look 
think we deserve something better. And I, I think the road commission, their concern will be maintenance of it. So I guess if we can yep. demonstrate to them that, that we would maintain it, uh, perhaps they would, because I believe right now I, I've seen, uh, there's one on Elms and uh, Grand Blank. No, yeah, Grand Blank Road that uh, is gravel, and they said they will not do that again. The gravel spilled all over the road, uh, so they said that they were going to pave it. But perhaps you know we can put our heads together and figure out a plan for maintaining it, or how we can get it maintained. Well, I'm willing to go back down there and find out how they do it down there, rather than trying to reinvent mm -hmm. the wheel because. We had you, I think it was last yep. month that you complimented the DPW and everybody yes. from cleaning up how many right. pounds of uh, asphalt. Four tons, yeah. I mean, the, over, the overpass over 475 on, on Hill Road um, has asphalt in the median, right. probably similar to what the plan would be for that roundabout. And uh, it, while it's easier to maintain, there's still maintenance even when you have an asphalt covering because the weeds grow up in the cracks. Uh, so I can, if, if that were a grass area, you know, the median on Hill Road, which it can't be because of the overpass, but I can only imagine how it would have looked with the weeds and everything else growing if, if that was open. So somehow we got to figure out, even for that overpass, how we maintain it. It's, it's not our responsibility, that overpass, in terms of, you know, looking at who the governmental body is to maintain that. But if they aren't going to do it, we certainly don't want to just leave it with all the rubble and what have you. Mr. Kent? I just wanted to make sure we were clarifying that was not our responsibility. We were just doing it. The same right. would be true with that roundabout, right? Right. Well, if, if we push them, I would I want to make sure whatever we have put in there, it's going to, the appearance of it's going to look good with as low maintenance as possible because I, I don't see many others coming to our township to maintain things that are appearance, uh, you know, will end up maintaining that if, if we tell them we want the only way that they're going to not put asphalt on there or concrete is if we tell them that we will maintain it because they aren't going to want to maintain that they won't so uh, yeah mr guzak what they've done in the past because <clears throat> i know that like the triangle down in flint because i'm in the flint downtown Qantas for a long period of time our Qantas club actually took care of that triangle so it was a service club that came in and maintained it uh as well as changing shrubs or whatever so the only way it's going to work is if you have some service club out in grand blank that wants to take that on because otherwise it's just going to fall through the cracks very good point so we'll continue we to discuss a subcommittee that. on appearance right and we will <laughs> we'll put that on the agenda and we'll talk to the road commission about it Okay, I think we have consensus that uh, we we'll move forward on that. Future positioning, the board will review the uh, fiscal year 2018 proposed budget. Mr. Limita? So all I need is for Thursday, if there's any information that I can provide um, to uh, facilitate that discussion, uh, I just need direction from the board if there's any additional information you need in any aspect of the um, budget as presented, I'd be happy to have that presented. If there's any specific department head that you would like here to answer specific questions, I will have them here for Thursday as well. And yeah, I see you emailed us uh, the copies of all the narratives as well, which was helpful. Mr. Bancy? Yes. I think uh, Director Kathy should be here. Okay. Yes. And uh, Director Jeff. We don't have his DPW. his uh, DPW budget isn't out. I mean, I can hit that copy's ready to come out for November. Um, but again, typically the DPW budget isn't required by the board to be approved by the board. It's an enterprise fund, um, but the governmental funds, and that's why you have the special revenue funds and the general fund. Okay. Uh, but I would certainly, um, Jeff will be here to do his presentation of the DPW budget at the meeting of November 26th or whatever it is. 26. Okay. 20, 22nd, I think. 22nd, whatever. Yeah. Mr. Guzak? Yeah, I just had one question that they, they can look at. I know I was looking at the uh, the new lease vehicles that we were looking at. I know it indicated like 13000 for two additional vehicles, and I think it's for our lieutenants, uh, the new lieutenants that we have, where in the past we yeah. haven't had that. Uh, 
but I know from previous experience, that's $13,000, which is like $541 a car. Right now we have three leased vehicles that are approximately $300 a month. Uh, so I don't know if the cost has went up that drastic, uh, but we're getting only two cars and we're paying more than we are for three. So something's, uh, maybe it's just the, if we could just get clarification on that. Sure, and I can tell you right now that a portion of it is higher than uh, what it was, but if you recall, we sold three vehicles um, that we uh, had Enterprise sell, and we put the value of those um, sold against the lease payments that we had on the initial three vehicles that we ordered for a lease through Enterprise. So, and they weren't a lot. I think all those vehicles were somewhere between $2,000 or $2,400 a piece. They were pretty well worn out by the time we um, got rid of them. Uh, so that did impact the price of our leases coming down, although I think before they brought those down, they were around 390 or somewhere around there, um, Chief, if that rings a bell with you. Uh, so we know that they're going to be in um, somewhere around that $400. Yeah, but this is, this well, unless you're hedging, this is like 540 So it's not, you know, that's like $100, $140 more. But. Another way Chief Wiles tries to hide money in the budget. <laughs> 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 I would just hope we could get three vehicles instead of two if we're going to okay. be leasing. So. Okay, we can take a closer look at that then on yeah. Thursday. Ms. Lane? Why are we having to buy all new vehicles? Don't we have any Tahoes and some of the others that are uh, usable? I mean, new we vehicles all the time. I don't know how often you're turning them over because I wasn't here for any of that discussion. But I don't think it's necessary when the township taxpayer is paying for vehicles to be buying or leasing new ones when we might have some other ones like you're using, Mr. Limita, that they can drive. Well, one of the things that we did, Ms. Lane, over the past four years uh, prior to your uh, election was that uh, we developed a schedule for replacement both in the DPW and the police because uh, the first few years that I was on the board, I, I really didn't uh, think we need to spend half of our board meetings debating which vehicles we should buy and which ones we shouldn't. And so we, we developed a schedule that, that uh, of what vehicles over what period of time we needed to replace so that, because I think uh, a good amount of board time was spent debating whether or not we should buy a vehicle. Um, again, we want our board to focus on um, looking at things from a 30,000 foot view and where do we want to go as opposed to focusing on operational issues. If we have a budget and our department head um, says this is what they need and our superintendent agrees with them and uh, what fits within the budget, then um, if, if the vehicles work for them and we've, we've looked at what their, their plan is for the purchase of vehicles over a period of time, it's hard for me to say, well, I don't want to get this vehicle. And then, you know, um, I think we, we end up micromanaging a schedule of equipment that we really have no idea whether or not it's functional or not. Mr. Limina? The police vehicles typically come out of rotation at about 140 to 150,000 miles. Um, we believe that that is about uh, the end of their useful life as far as being used as a pursuit vehicle. Um, and we typically base that on uh, the expertise of our uh, senior mechanic Mm -hmm. uh, and he tells us that when these vehicles should be pulled. So those are the ones that are on the replacement schedule between 140 and 150. As to whether we can rotate those in instead of buying anything in the pool um, vehicles, the, the last year or this year we replaced one vehicle for assessing. Uh, we do have those vehicles in the pool. They're both in the police pool and the general pool for use uh, that have high miles. Like you mentioned the Tahoe, the 2010 Tahoe that uh, is assigned to me has 150 some thousand miles on it. Um, the we have several others that are assigned in the police pool that are high mileage, 150 some thousand uh, mile vehicles that we continue <coughs> to keep on the road. The vehicle that we replaced this year uh, had concerns about the frame rusting. It was a Buick Century. It, w it only had 68 thousand miles. It was used for assessing and as a general <coughs> administration pool car. Um, it was a 2000 and two maybe, I don't remember, it was, but it yeah, was the orders of Buick Century. 
the concerns from our mechanic was that the frame was starting to rust and it was time to get rid of it, that it was costing us more money than it was worth keeping, even though it had low miles. I believe we got $1,000 for it when we put it out on govdeals.com maybe. Uh, the vehicle that we're talking about replacing next time, I believe is, it might even be that um, 2002 Malibu. Uh, but we're, the vehicles that we replace are thoroughly worn out when we replace them. Our thought with assessing was that we needed to have some vehicles because they do attend classes, they do attend coursework outside, and we do put them out into the township in these vehicles every single day that when we buy the vehicles like the one we put in there into service this year, we intend to keep those for 10 years or until such time that we think that the residual value is at the point that it would make sense to sell it and replace. Um, so it's not like these vehicles, we're, we're putting everybody in new vehicles. We're taking vehicles out of service that are nearly 15 years of age with uh, either way high miles on them or to the point where the cost of repair is not where I feel comfortable putting our employees out into them into a daily drive vehicle. Ms. Lane. All right. I haven't been here for several years. Am I wrong? But I have the understanding that... Um, the leased cars are ones that they take home and drive back and forth to work in. It's not being used for, I mean, like everybody else, we drive our car to work, and I'm not including the chief in this because I have no problem with him having the use of a car. But in other departments, officers that are on call have the vehicles to take home when they're on call. So every what is officer, the I think everybody <laughs> in the command staff is taking them home every night, even if they're not on call. And I, if, and if I'm wrong, I'd like to be corrected, but you know, if we have the vehicles here and they're coming to work and they use mm -hmm. them during the day when they're at work, that's one thing. But if they're taking mm -hmm. them home and driving them around, yeah. Mr. Lamida. So those vehicles are assigned to police personnel who, uh, when you look at our command staff, even though they're not on call, they're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If something happens in police, the, the officers who are assigned to command do have their vehicles, they do take them home, and we expect them to respond in the, in, in, no matter where they are and what time it is uh, in the event of an emergency. So that was why that the command vehicles and why the command staff was was uh, allowed to drive their vehicles to and from. There's also, uh, everybody has to be within a 20 mile radius and they all are in within that 20 miles of the township radius. So the vehicles that are taken home to and from are because they're in a command position, they're required to, res to report in the event of an emergency. I mean, this isn't anything new, is it? I no. Mean, any other comments or concerns other than on Thursday, we'll, we'll ask uh, Ms. Solstack, you'd like her here, uh, Mr. Massey? Yes, sir. Our finance director? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Moving on. Uh, Mr. Let's talk Chief, about, yes. I have a thought about uh, the director being here. I would like for us to address this issue now. Mm -hmm. Can we move her up on the agenda, the budget discussion somewhere up on the agenda so she doesn't have to set? Here for the entire meeting. Yeah, we can take a look at that. We can, uh, I can adjust the agenda now that uh, the board's had the opportunity to work through it and get most of their questions answered on the variety of issues that are before mm -hmm. you. We typically have future positioning farther up at the beginning of the agenda. We moved it down specifically because of the number of issues and the folks that we had coming in this evening uh, to address the board. And so if the board would like, we can certainly make that agenda adjustment, put the budget, um, yeah, I think that's a very good suggestion. Let's accommodate that and move it up so she doesn't have to stay late. With that, uh, Mr. Limiter or Mr. Laddie, is there a need for executive session? There is. There is okay. a need for an executive session to discuss a, uh, an employment agreement. Is there a motion to uh, go into executive session? Move that we go into executive session to discuss an employment agreement. Support. Support. Mr. Okay. Kent. Yes. Mr. Mansour. Yes. Mr. Guzak. Yes. Mr. Massey. Yes. Myself. Yes. Mr. Bennett. Yes.